Good morning and, uh, in Asia and also good evening in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm Suk Jong Lee, Senior Fellow at East Asia Institute, and I'm very delighted to have an online seminar entitled Enhancing Democratic Partnership in the Indo-Pacific Region. Let me explain why we have chosen this topic. Um, the region of Indo-Pacific has emerged we used to use Asia Pacific, but these days we uh, many people use this term. And there are two visions in Indo-Pacific order. One is a bipolar order, so we have a U.S.-led sphere of influence and China-led sphere. And in this bipolarity, uh, some people say the polarity is not clear-cut. It's uh, more like a fuzzy because of economy dependence between the United States and China. On the other hand, some people say this bipolarity uh, is not that meaningful because there are still important uh, middle powers in the region. So some people advocate multipolarity. And whatever the polarity is in the future regional order, the concept of democracy has emerged as a very important pol uh, pillar of the order of, the, of our region. And when we say the multilateral order, multilateral order means uh, the members of multilateral institutions have equal uh, right to speak, right to decide, regardless of a political system. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's a democracy or authoritarian government, as long as we follow up the rule of uh, uh, regional governance democratically, the internal political system does not matter. On the other hand, so some people will say the values, the liberal democratic values of any multilateral institution is very important to sustain those institutions. Uh, so therefore, all these principles of uh, democracy uh, respect to uh, individual freedom, uh, and also associations, and also rule of law, and media freedom, and all these uh, democratic principles are important. So therefore, if we read any discussions in this Indo-Pacific regional region, there is a lot of saying about we need to uh, uh, bolster democracy for peace and prosperity of our region. Uh, and here, in our region, actually, there are many multilateral institutions. However, the themes of a democracy uh, is not that strongly discussed or promoted among the multilateral institutions of our region. There are many reasons. They say Asians uh, don't like to intervene in internal matters, so it's very uh, awkward uh, to speak strongly about the democracy overseas promotion. And at the same time, some Asian countries worry about the uh, geopolitizing economic ties with China when we speak our democracy in regional agenda. And also, we recently, we talk a lot about the decline of uh, the American leadership in promoting democracy uh, in the region and also in the, uh, globally. And in addition to these, and there are uh, pandemics. Because of pandemics, many democratic countries are not supporting uh, overseas democracy because they are so busy with uh, the internal matters. And to discuss all these things, uh, we invited SOT leaders from six democracies, India, Indonesia, Japan, Philippines, and the U.S., and South Korea, if we include a moderator like me. And let me invite uh, these uh, five panelists uh, uh, by the order of uh, alphabetic order last name. Uh, we have Teresa Deles. She's a co-founder and chair of International Center for Innovation, Transformation, and Excellence in Governance. And we have Mike Green, Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at Washington-based think tank CSIS and Director of Asian Studies at Georgetown University. And we have Dhruba uh, Zaishenka. Uh, he is a director of a U.S. initiative in Observer Research Foundation of India. And we have Marty Natalegawa. 
He's a former foreign minister of Indonesia. And lastly, we have uh, Ambassador Yukio Takasu. Uh, he used to be an uh, ambassador, a uh, representative to United Nations, but now chairing the study team on the future of democracy at the Japan Center for International Exchange. So that's great. So we have uh, five great uh, thought leaders. Um, before I start uh, two rounds of discussion, uh, I'd like to suggest to audience uh, if you have a questions, uh, you can use the the button. Um, so you can just type up in the uh, in the box, and then just click the sending button. Uh, then the, we'll collect the question, and the, we'll ask panelists to answer uh, at the end of uh, the two rounds of discussion. Okay, let's start the first round of discussion. Uh, let me ask why democratic partnership in the Indo-Pacific region is so important from your country's perspective and what your country can do better in these corporations. And first, I'd like to invite Mike Green because he led a group of uh, experts to discuss the democratic partnership in this region and they um, published a report early this year. So Mike, why don't you explain the why this partnership is important? And also, let me ask you your view whether the US government leadership for democracy would be restored in the next administration. So Mike, it's your turn. Thank you very much. And um, it's wonderful to be uh, with you all this evening, Washington time. Um, we met in California at the beautiful um, Annenberg Estate at Sunnylands uh, with a group of thought leaders, some of them are here with us on the panel today, um, to explore um, the possibility of strengthening uh, democratic partnership. Um, sometimes in the US we call this democratic unity, but it's really an equal partnership among democracies in Asia to support, reinforce, uh, enhance um, and advance democratic governance in the region. Um, the project was uh, started with CSIS and the National Endowment for Democracy. We had support from the Japanese Foreign Ministry and we had outstanding thought leaders from across the region. We, we put out a statement of principles, which is on our website at CSIS. We argued that um, democracy cooperation partnership matters because democracy is critical to the enjoyment of fundamental human rights, because in our view, democracy works. We met before the coronavirus, before COVID, but when you look at the most successful countries in managing COVID, their democracies like Korea, uh, New Zealand, Taiwan, we argued, and the evidence clearly shows that democratic norms are widespread. This comes out in the ICS surveys in Southeast Asia, uh, in surveys we do at CSIS of thought leaders in Asia, Overwhelmingly, the norms that um, these thought leaders think should guide East Asian integration in the future, and we give a long list, but top of the list is always democratic governance, human rights, women's empowerment, good governance. We just finished a survey at CSIS, a worldwide survey uh, about China, but we asked about human rights and democracy, and in it, thought leaders in the United States and Asia and Europe um, all had about the same level of support for advancing human rights. On a scale from 1 to 10, the mean was uh, over 7 in all three regions. There are differences, of course, which I'll come to. Um, and, of course, democratic partnership matters because democracy faces challenges. Uh, nowhere more right now than the U.S. in many respects. We are a polarized country. There are very, very difficult debates right now about race, um, and um, our presidential election is being watched by the whole world. And democracy is ugly, people say, and our democracy right now is sometimes proving that. But around the world, um, there are authoritarian backlashes, closing civil society space. Uh, democracies that made important transitions like Myanmar are struggling. So the successful democracies, and democracy is a constant struggle and experiment, but the ones that have been at it uh, and had success have a responsibility to the global um, community and to their own citizens to help those uh, countries in transition make a successful uh, move. 
we emphasized in our statement that democracy is diverse. Um, yes, overwhelmingly in Asia, outside of China and Singapore, overwhelmingly in polls, um, democratic norms are placed as a very high priority. But so is non-interference in internal affairs uh, in Indonesia and in India in Thailand, not in Japan, not in Korea, not in Taiwan, but in ASEAN and South Asia. Um, non-interference in internal affairs is, is also considered a very high principle. That's a very different way of thinking about things from Americans or Japanese or Canadians who are much more willing to criticize and pressure on human rights. So there's diversity. Um, but I would only say to that that there's diversity in how America approaches human rights and democracy. We have Human Rights Watch, which quite loudly calls for specific cases to be redressed. I'm on the board of the Asia Foundation, which quietly works with governments to improve uh, governance and civil society within the laws of that country. So even the American approach to supporting democracy is very eclectic and very diverse. Um, what we talked about was how can we harness um, these um, eclectic but common views of democracy to have a more effective partnership in the region. And I can say more about that in the next panel, but the key points are um, we should compare best practices, we should learn from each other, we should each play to our strengths. Korea, for example, is very good at women's empowerment. Hoika spends money very successfully. I've seen the projects in Mongolia and Cambodia enhancing women's empowerment. Um, so each country has things it does well. The key thing we were trying to um, advance here is let's do it together. Let's coordinate our objectives. Let's work together in, in the East Asia Summit, in APEC, in the SARC. Let's, let's come up with a common agenda, and then we'll each do what we do best and learn from each other. Um, and that was the main point. I can talk about the U.S. if you like, uh, but I don't want to take time from the other panelists, so just let me know. Okay. Uh, so, Mike, maybe you can answer that one in the second round. That's great. Sure. Great introduction. Uh, all right. Then let's uh, move to uh, Philippines. And, Teresa, uh, the Philippines is facing uh, democratic backsliding uh, due to your president uh, very uh, aggressive with drug war. And I guess a democratic partnership is very needed to your country at this moment. So or can you explain uh, the situation and how, even though the domestic problem, how Philippines is doing to promote, to defend the democracy in the region? Teresa? Yes, um, <clears throat> good morning. Good morning, everyone. And yes, that should be the starting point when we uh, talk about um, about the uh, democratic partnership when we speak from the philippines is to acknowledge that we are in fact in a very bad position now and it's not the first time we have uh, emerged from a dictatorship just uh, a little over 30 years ago and i think that is part of our commitment uh, to to regional uh, solidarity because at that particular time we did we did survive because of support um, from other countries, from other democratic forces, and we know that that's the way to go. So more than at any other time, again, we are very concerned about um, regional partnerships and solidarity for democracy. And I hope it is by this time already emb embodied in the um, Philippine democratic practice uh, to not just confine ourselves within our boundaries. And, but of course, because of uh, where we are now, it is a solidarity, we can say, in, in resistance uh, for, for us. Um, it is not a solidarity with states. It is those for democratic forces that are, in many cases, outside of the, of the state. And already, we, we see the gains here, and this is where we continue to work. Uh, gaining the uh, shared understanding of the threats to democracy uh, is important. Otherwise, you think this thing that's happening, the thing that's happening in my country, I always say it's not a, um, it, it's not a, an isolated, um, it's not an isolated um, problem. And when we find out that we are with the uh, Asian Democracy Research Network and we all did a study on populism, that in fact, that is a problem in the region in many different forms as well as as in the world and that 
um, discussing this, you understand more what is going on in our country. And, it's, and that's important and to share also our learnings there. As well, we need to learn about good practices. Uh, we need to share the knowledge about how do you push back, how do you uh, fight this. We've had conversations, for example, with Hong Kong. Um, very important to have a dialogue with the women in, in South Asia who are pushing back against this, um, again, uh, surge. It, 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 it's always been there, but the surge of misogyny at this time. Uh, and it amplifies our voices, especially when our voices are stifled inside. It's important when we know that our voices are being heard outside, when resolutions come out, and that we are, in fact, able to bring our issues on international official platforms. Uh, and, 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 and I must say that, in fact, in a discussion with civil society in the Philippines, somebody said the most important thing is the upliftment of the spirit. Because that's important. Democracy work at this time in many parts of the world and in the Philippines is exhausting. It is sometimes you think you're not going anywhere. But to be with others in the same fight, that is an upliftment of the spirit. And we hope that it begins a contagion of hope and, um, of hope and courage. Uh, but let me just talk about some challenges that we see that we need to do both um, nationally inside and, and regionally to learn more how to do it. Um, is to have common analysis of the, of uh, a shared analysis of the problems that we face. We're looking particularly at populism, at fundamentalism, and the, uh, and the problem in, for, of, of China incursion in its many different forms. And very important, we are saying it's important for democracy forces to um, to work to develop uh, effective counter narratives, which means taking on new forms. We need to do more cultural forms. We need to do more creative forms because the narrative has been taken over and we need to win that back, uh, which means... Um, also that we begin to be more aware of the language, apparently the language we have been using sometimes alienates people, it, uh, language has been captured and we have to get that back. And sa more savvy use of social media and the new in information technologies because they're, they have way ahead of us learned how to do that. And finally, the, the, the challenge that we see is the need for democrat democratic forces to practice what we preach. It's important to, and we have to be very aware that as we preach democracy, it's important that we also practice it within our ranks, how we practice leadership, how we practice power, how we use the civic space when we are in it. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for talking about democratic spread. Okay. Now let's move to India. When we map the Indo-Pacific region, uh, India is very critical in this mapping, and India is the largest democracy. Uh, and however, we also know internally there is a rising Hindu nationalism inside, but still India is very critical in this democratic partnership. So let me invite Dhruva to talk about the vision of a democracy from Indian perspective, through. Thank you, uh, and thank you for having me on this panel. Um, as you know, uh, as has been mentioned already by uh, Professor Green and others, uh, India, in some ways, embodies the uh, the dilemma or the paradox of uh, democratic cooperation around the world. On the one hand. Indians are proud of uh, India being the world's largest democracy. How uh, every Indian uh, general election is the largest uh, organized political activity in, in, in history. Uh, every time it takes place, um, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, at least rhetorically, India has been very shy about talking about democratic cooperation, democratic unity, and democratic promotion. Um, in some ways, the the actions, however, uh, sort of belie that that ambivalence, uh, the rhetorical ambivalence, when it comes to um, uh, democratic uh, support and, and promotion. Uh, and in fact, I think you see, you know, if you look back, uh, there's a lot of interesting work being done, uh, looking at Indian uh, actions in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, up to the 90s and 2000s, where India did play a role and sometimes quite a critical role. Uh, I would say in two areas, particularly which is South Asia, its, its immediate neighborhood, and in Africa, 
in supporting uh, rising democratic movements and whether it was leading a global coalition against apartheid in South Africa, whether it was supporting a newly decolonized country such as Ghana and Nigeria uh, in, 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 in Congo in, in and their, in their efforts at uh, state building. Um, and actually more recently in places like Afghanistan, to some degree in Myanmar and Sri Lanka, Maldives uh, and Bangladesh, amongst other places. So uh, I, I think this in some ways embodies the, the, the contradiction we've seen. On the one hand, India talks about non-interference and, and in some cases actually means it, works with other countries to ensure that sovereignty is guarded. Um, however, I'd say there are three elements, I think, of what uh, democratic cooperation looks like from an Indian perspective. Uh, one is uh, coordination and norm setting with other democracies. You see this a little bit at the United Nations, uh, in regional institutions. And the, the new trend re has really been issue-based or uh, regional groupings. Um, such as on uh, issues such as supply chain resilience, artificial intelligence, maritime security, uh, infrastructure financing, um, and technological norms. And these are areas where India is actually working closely with, with countries, other countries that happen to be democracies, I think because there's a like-mindedness uh, in how they approach these issues, uh, in setting certain norms and standards and coordinating efforts. Uh, there's also a lot of work being done at the bilateral basis. So I think, I'd say this is sort of one area where you've seen India play some role. Um, uh, and, and a growing role, uh, arguably. A second has been in terms of development partnerships. India offers about $1.5 billion a year in gr overseas grants, uh, largely in South Asia and Africa, um, and to other uh, uh, developing countries, uh, and has about $25 billion of, of overseas credit uh, that it's given, uh, often in, in smaller projects, smaller loans to, to uh, the developing world. And many of these are linked to supporting local human populations, local governance, local um, empowerment. Um, and, and so there is a strong sort of democratic element to this, uh, to a lot of this assistance. It's not top, not, not always top down. The final area, I think, which gets also quite uh, very little attention is technical uh, assistance and, and support and training. Uh, and this, this extends to electoral assistance. So the Indian uh, Election Commission actually does a lot of uh, help in, in the mechanics of in training uh, individuals in the, in the mechanics of uh, election um, uh, in, in many parts of the world. It come in, in some uh, uh, military uh, training as well, uh, has a, a component on civil military relations, uh, which uh, also contributes, is meant to contribute to a, a country's democratic uh, society. And uh, again, a lot of social welfare uh, focused uh, projects uh, as well. Um, so in some ways, we only now getting into the, the the effort of mapping out sort of where where India is doing a lot of these, and again, not, a lot of these projects are not really couched in the language of democracy per se, and yet have a small d democratic uh, spirit behind them. Um, my final point I would say is that uh, you know that some some of these areas have been a bit more successful, uh, sometimes more successful than Indians think, but other areas I think are still very much found wanting. And one area I think that hasn't yet taken off to the degree many had expected is joint projects with other countries, with the U.S., with Japan, uh, with Europe, uh, in third countries that would benefit uh, democracies. There's a lot of talk about that. I think there's a lot of effort in, in moving in that direction, but there's yet very little to see in terms of uh, outcomes. So that, that, that would be one area where it would be good to see uh, more of a focus, uh, at least from an Indian perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruva. It sounds quite impressive because uh, India is doing all this technical assistance and, uh, and, and also normative things in South Asia and also Africa. That's great. Uh, let's move to ASEAN. And India uh, has been a strong leader in ASEAN regionalism. And ASEAN is a critical uh, sub-region of Indo-Pacific. Uh, and Marty uh, served the country as a, a foreign minister, so I'm sure Marty has many things to say. So uh, let me invite Marty to speak about the, the Indonesian's perspective on democratic partnership. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed for inviting me to this platform. Uh, needless to say, I speak uh, in my own personal capacity. Uh, I do not represent uh, the government's view on these methods. But, um, you know, the point that I wanted to make is to, to, uh, to the point that others have mentioned uh, on the nexus between uh, democracy and this principle of non-interference and, uh, and the like. I think this is one of the key uh, uh, challenges that countries in Southeast Asia have been 
uh, grappling with, have been have been trying to address. How can we, on the one hand, promote the notion of democratic partnership, uh, promotion of democracy, a democratic principle, and at the same time, constantly uh, 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 respect the principle of uh, non-interference. And I think Indonesia's case has been instrumental and, and quite illuminating. Uh, in 1998, when Indonesia transformed uh, from an authoritarian state to a, a country that promotes democracy in a more central way, and that is the, the first conundrum that we face. How can we be a thriving democracy uh, amidst a region that do not place democracy at the forefront of its uh, uh, outlook and cooperation? Hence, purposefully and deliberately, uh, while we undertake our own constant uh, democratic transformation, we began to introduce the, uh, the, the language and discourse on democracy within ASEAN. Uh, it wasn't easy because it, was, it is not normal for ASEAN to consider these matters, but uh, deliberately and purposefully we introduced the idea of the ASEAN political security community, pillar. In other words, a community cannot only be economic in nature, it must also refer to democratic development and, and good governance and respect for human rights and civil liberties, uh, essentially to ensure that Indonesia's transformations uh, goes hand in hand with ASEAN's own uh, transformation. It may not be at the same speed, but at least the, the overall uh, uh, trust is, is in the same uh, direction. And in that quest, it hasn't been easy because we have had to constantly uh, in, uh, inject momentum, uh, nurture a new, new habit of cooperation. The capacity building, the, the, the legislative uh, dimension of uh, democratic building was the easier part because we can, we can come up, come up uh, with all kinds of agreements on, uh, on democracy, on human rights within ASEAN, ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, the ASEAN Charter itself, but uh, this you know, left unattended will remain simply potentials and, and, and capacities on paper. And what Indonesia has done in the past, and I have to emphasize that, uh, is that we try to provide a concrete leadership uh, in, in practice and in form in changing the, dyna the dynamics. Uh, Indonesia deliberately and purposefully sharing developments within Indonesia with our ASEAN colleagues. Uh, without them even asking, uh, you know, I mean, even at the cost of making things a little bit uncomfortable for them, uh, we inform them, developments in Indonesia, the problems that we are having, hoping to create a contagion, uh, uh, a positive contagion, multiplier effect, and they began to also share developments in their own countries. But once such practices are, are stopped, are no longer nurtured and developed, then we are beginning to see a, a, a regression wherein many of the potentials and capacities on paper that even now currently exist uh, remain uh, dormant and, and un, un, uh, un, unused, so to speak. And hence, uh, in the past, we have been able to speak uh, uh, forcefully and, and, and yet in a, in a friendly manner uh, uh, on developments within our own respective countries. But nowadays, I think, uh, because of uh, uh, abeyance, because of... Uh, uh, lack of constant nurturing, we are seeing uh, a lot of this potential becoming increasingly one uh, that is uh, dormant. But uh, the, the, another point that I want to emphasize is that, in, in other words, the point that I want to emphasize is that we need to find uh, a, a way of addressing this apparent conflict between promotion and respect for democratic principles and the notion of uh, non-interference. And I think, actually, ASEAN already has a script uh, 2003 onwards to the ASEAN community, but somehow uh, we are back to square one uh, as if uh, the two are polar opposites. And then this is a development of uh, extreme uh, disappointment to me personally uh, to be in this situation again. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, we really appreciate this Indonesia's intentional and you said uh, very deliberate uh, speaking about democracy. After all, uh, Indonesia is hosting the Bali Democracy Forum. That's very unusual 
intergovernmental forum where NGOs are participating using the term democracy exclusively. So that's great. And now let's move to Japan. Uh, let me invite uh, Ambassador Yukio Takasu. Japan has been the most uh, stable representative of democracy in the region, in Asia, and has been very active in promoting uh, democracy uh, with the United States, India, and Australia. And after all, the <coughs> Indo-Pacific region, this mapping uh, has been stimulated by uh, the uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe's FOIP, free and open Indo-Pacific. So I'm sure uh, Yukio has uh, a lot to say. So let me invite Yukio to speak. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, before going to talk about uh, free and open in the Pacific uh, issue, uh, perhaps let me uh, put this issue in context, particularly COVID-19 that all of us are suffering now, are having enormous impact on democracy and the freedom. Obviously, prior to this uh, pandemic, uh, democracy backsliding has been very noticeable globally in uh, the last 15 years, but particularly in the Pacific area, uh, the last five years. I think uh, uh, political right has been limited in many countries in this region, and press freedom has also controlled. Um, the COVID-19 made it abundantly clear that leadership matters. A crisis situation reveals real strength or lack of uh, leadership, personal, uh, reasonably. Good leader in normal time are not necessarily effective leader in crisis situation. And even democratic leaders have to limit the freedom of movement and apply other restrictions uh, to the extent that necessary and also to the duration to cope with pandemic. However, in democracy, we know because we have system of accountability in place, like a check and balance or independent press. Those measures are only temporary and likely to be uh, terminated when this uh, emergency is over. But the issue here is authoritarian leaders Authoritarianism countries took advantage of the pandemic to concentrate power more by marginalizing oppositions, uh, suppressing free press, applying new surveillance technologies, and imposing excessive control of privacy. These are likely to stay some of the things as a new standard even after crisis over. And they justify legal basis of this restriction because they were approved by law, ruled by law, which is very distinct from rule of law that we're going to talk about it like a Hong Kong national security law, could be considered in this light because uh, law was enacted fairly speedily during COVID-19 crisis. That made the popular gathering and mass demonstration to mobilize opposition more challenging and difficult. Uh, two weeks ago, China celebrated officially the victory over COVID-19. It's a very good news. And President Xi claimed the supremacy of socialism modernized uh, state system is uh, superior to control pandemic than others. But I think uh, this is a little bit uh, misleading because demo many democracies, as Mike told, uh, succeeded and also many other countries, democracy unsuccess unsuccessful. But also many authoritarian countries failed dismally. It doesn't mean that authoritarian systems is better. So it is not a matter of state system, but the nature of political leadership. An initial reluctance of transparency that's inherent in authoritarian controlled state caused a far-reaching uh, adverse impact with the new virus spreading in other countries. So COVID-19 awakened many people's eyes from complacency and made them to understand the real risk of authoritarianism and denial of freedom of expression. So we have deep concern about the state of democracy now. And of course, we have a, a tension between uh, US and China. This added a fresh light on the importance and urgency of free and open in the Pacific vision. As you said, the Prime Minister Abe uh, pursued free and open in the Pacific vision since uh, August 2016. He softened a little bit this concept from strategy. Originally, it was a strategy to vision in 2018, conveying the inclusiveness and openness of the concept. And together with build up security and trade economy, this promotion of fundamental value, such as rule of law and respect of freedom and human rights was one of the three pillars. And as uh, India, Indonesia, 
Japan has been extending support to many uh, countries in the effort of democratization in the region in accordance with so-called Development Cooperation Charter and its national security strategy. But unlike uh, other pillars such as security area or trade economy area, uh, which has been more uh, concrete substance and actions like a Quad or TPP or high quality infrastructures and others, not so much concrete steps in democracy front. Japan has been in sense timid, in my view, in expanding democratization support, particularly civil society and the media. It's because, as you know, the political and historical sensitivity of issues involved. And also, Japan is taking traditionally so-called government-to-government -government principle, extending bilateral cooperation, in which uh, Japan responds in principle only to the request by government. Uh, obvious, obviously, Japan has achieved its peace and prosperity in post-war area and benefit greatly free, with free trade and mm -hmm. based international order. So erosion of which would severely hamper continued sound development in Japan. In my view, Japan has responsibility and duty to work against weakening democratic governance, erosion of free trade and rule-based international order. So given the worrisome trend of further backsliding democracy, Japan has been, I think, uh, should do more. That is, I think, uh, some of us are doing. And uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Suga, uh, who worked closely with Prime Minister Abe as a Chief Cabinet Secretary for nearly six years, was just uh, nominated the uh, day before yesterday as a new Prime Minister. And one of the first things he did was to instruct uh, Prime Minister Motegi, Motegi to advance the realization of uh, FOIP vision as priority. But here, again, uh, in my view, democratization front fundamental value in the one of the three pillars uh, should be equally emphasized on security and uh, trade and economy. Uh, in this way, uh, well, I am chairing a JCIA study project on the future of democracy. We're focusing on mobilizing uh, political support and on understanding the importance urgency of protecting uh, protect values. Probably I will talk about more later in the second session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yukio. Uh, so uh, we finished the first round of discussion. All panelists have uh, emphasized the important democratic principles and democratic values. And they uh, also said that the, the benchmarking good practice is important. Uh, and I recall Druva has mentioned small d rather than large capital D democracy. That means each country has a certain edge uh, doing this democratic cooperation and de democratic partnership. So that's great to move to the second round of discussion. And second round of discussion, uh, we've talked a lot about democratic community, but community that time um, uh, is losing popularity because of the, the European Union experiences and how difficult to uh, maintain the spirit of a community um, facing all this uh, uh, emerging global crisis. Um, so we are talking about like-minded uh, countries or like-minded uh, non-state uh, actors. It doesn't have to be state. There are many rooms for non-state actors can play to uh, promote democracy and to do many diverse corporations. Uh, for example, South Korea has been rather reluctant to speak out <coughs> democracy, even though internally our democracy is, is very vibrant and very dynamic. However, uh, recently South Korea uh, has been active, be, begin to be more active uh, in participating uh, D10, Democracy 10 uh, globally. And also last year we joined uh, Drive for Democracy, uh, which the Sweden uh, is playing the leadership. So I think that's very important to, fo to form this kind of diverse, uh, small, like-minded uh, people, uh, country to promote uh, democracy. So uh, I'd like to invite the panels again to offer more concrete programs and more innovative ideas that uh, we need uh, to carry out
this kind of uh, uh, partnership among democracies. So uh, let me invite uh, this time by the alphabetic order of last names. So, Teresita, you go first. All right. Um, thank you, yes. Um, and yes, I, I will say that right now we look at um, probably lateral groups or this um, a smaller community of democracy forces at, at this particular time. We look at civil society forces. We look at the non-state independent institutions in different in other countries that we partner with. But of course, we long for the time that um, the Philippines again as a state becomes engaged in this um, and becomes as engaged in this discourse and in fact be a leader in it as once upon a time we were. As uh, so once upon a time, people did get inspiration, um, and very recently, in fact, but that is not um, the case now. And it's very important. Um, it, it is, in fact, very important for us to look for those spaces in regional um, official um, associations to find those spaces, because we do find in this particular case that many of the states around us are timid are timid to speak up um, uh, because I think they are protecting projects they are protecting projects they're protecting relationships with 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 our government um, but um, I it's always good to, uh, to remind the people that when when democracy um, is weakened that in the end as we did find out already again in very recent memory in the Philippines uh, the deterioration of democracy means that those projects, those economic um, partnerships are also not going to survive uh, very long. So in this current space that we have, which is looking at how we do forge um, partnerships and associations with other um, democracy forces, mainly from outside um, states, uh, we are looking at the need, as, as I had uh, said before, to make sure that democracy forces itself practices democracy. Uh, but we are looking at how in our uh, regional work uh, that there be more mechanisms um, for the participation and the voice of the marginalized, because sometimes they also become co-opted. Uh, their voices are always mediated by formal organizations and by um, possibly elitist leadership, even in democracy, democratic forces. So we need to make sure that we are really capturing the needs and the voices of the most marginalized. Very important for us is to see how the youth come into the picture. It's very important. This cannot be um, uh, the role of uh, gray, the gray-haired warriors, uh, the white-haired warriors like me, that's important, but it cannot be so. The torch needs to be passed. Young people need to get into this, this discourse and regional work. Women's sisterhood um, in Asia needs to be revived as it once was when we were fighting uh, for the Beijing platform. I think that in a way has weakened a bit and in this particular time, when misogyny is again on the rise, it's important to make sure that that uh, Asian sisterhood is again vibrant, um, pushing back uh, against the uh, the uh, the repression on 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 the, um, rights we have already won. So people to people interaction as well. How do we really make that happen? Because democracy needs to become alive among our people and reaching out to other people. Uh, and um, finally, um, this is of, uh, of interest amongst um, Philippine civil society forces, is that to make sure that within that, within our own national efforts, as well as um, in the regional solidarity work, we do look at the question of self-care and wellness for democracy activists. And I think Filipinos, our Philippine civil society right now is really pushing that theme very strongly because we know that democracy is a long fight and we are going to have to constantly be ready for reversals and we cannot burn out. So it's important that we take care, that taking care of democracy in our nations, in the region also mean, means knowing how to take care internally and personally of those who keep on fighting that fight and never give up. Thank you, Teresa. 
Yeah, I think we've been seeing how your uh, civic associations and civic society actors are doing very important role to sustain democracy in your country. Um, let's move to USA because America is so important. Uh, America has uh, many resources to support democracy overseas. And already Mike has mentioned what CSIS is doing uh, to research the, the, the importance of democracy and, and global governance uh, in also in the Pacific uh, region. And also I'd like to add uh, the question of USA uh, new leadership. Um, in the first round of discussion, we didn't have enough time to uh, extend more time to Mike to speak because many people will say under the Trump ad administrations, he has neglected too much uh, about this American leadership in defending and promoting democracy. So Mike, uh, let us know what will happen in the next administrations. Thank you. Um, before I try to explain the American uh, politics and foreign policy approach uh, to uh, democracy, let me just quickly um, pick up on Teresita's very inspirational uh, words just now. I'm sitting comfortably in Bethesda, Maryland, and she's in the front line of democracy, and her words are very powerful. And I just want to say that in particular, I think as we talk about democratic partnership or democratic unity, um, women's empowerment is probably, it could be the most important thing we could all do together. As I mentioned earlier, COICA, Korea's aid agency, has a very successful program of women's empowerment. Prime Minister Abe has emphasized Abenomics, hosts women's um, uh, major summit in Asia every year. Um, and studies show quite clearly that when women are involved in conflict resolution, the peace lasts longer. When women are involved in economic development strategies, um, the economic uh, development is more sustainable and inclusive. So it's, it's one of the areas where I, I just want to um, thank Teresita for highlighting it because Women's empowerment is, 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 is something that all of the democracies in Asia can agree on that has real results when we focus on it. Now, about the U.S., um, you know, the United States um, gets very depressed about democracy promotion after big, unpleasant, and unsuccessful counterinsurgencies. After the counterinsurgency campaign in Mindanao 100 years ago, Americans were depressed about our ability to support democracy. After the Vietnam War, you know, we lost uh, support for democracy. And after the Iraq War, support among the American people and in elites sagged. Uh, and at the same time, our own democracy faced some real dysfunctional um, obstacles. The Congress doesn't work well together. Partisanship is being you know, hyper um, active because of social media and the way our electoral system has, has been gerrymandered. Um, but I think um, things are going to turn around and already are. I'll give you a few reasons. First, um, in the United States, and frankly in other advanced uh, uh, economies uh, like uh, Japan, like Australia, like Canada, um, there's real alarm that our democracies are being interfered with. Um, in, in our case, the main alarm is about Russia. In the Australian case, it's about China. But you know, publics and politicians are worried about our own democracy being interfered with from abroad. That has mobilized people. Um, second, it, in the United States, um, support for working with allies and partners in public opinion polls has never been higher. In the survey we're, we're about to publish, 80% of American thought leaders say the best way to deal with competition from China is to strengthen our alliances and partnerships. And that will extend to democracy. I think if we listen to Korean experiences, if we listen to Indonesian experiences, and work together, um, the U.S. will be more effective. When I go to Myanmar and Cambodia, where I spend a lot of time, and I ask civil society groups about democracy, their model isn't the United States, it's Korea or Indonesia. So the, to the extent the U.S. is doing this with other countries, it, it's going to be more effective. Uh, third, um, I went to SAIS, I went to grad school in the 80s, mid-80s, and all the great Asian studies professors taught, uh, Lucian Pai, Nat Thayer, uh, Bob Scalapino, they taught that, that Asian societies don't naturally take to democracy. Um, and then shortly after I got my master's degree and before I got my PhD, Korea democratized, uh, Taiwan democratized, the Philippines democratized, 
So today's generation of Asia scholars and Asia experts in the universities, in the State Department, they don't believe that old story. They grew up and they did their PhDs watching democracy move forward with, you know, backsliding with challenges. But there's a, the, the new generation that we are training in the U.S. believes democracy will work, uh, but that we have to listen um, to the region. And I think that's creating a generation that's going to be quite effective. We asked in our recent survey about how much risk the United States should take to advance democracy and human rights in Asia. Um, and um, we got some interesting results. Over half of business leaders in our survey said they would be prepared to support targeted sanctions to advance democracy and human rights. That's a big change from a few years ago. And in terms of the next leader, you know, right now the polls suggest Joe Biden will win, but it really is hard to predict. It really is. The Biden campaign has made um, democracy, in some ways, the central theme of its foreign policy. If you look at Joe Biden's foreign affairs piece and his speeches, it's partly because of this, um, this anger in the Democratic Party about Russian interference in our election. But it's more than that. So I think a Biden administration would definitely um, bring back our um, historic emphasis on democracy and human rights. But even if President Trump is reelected, President Trump himself clearly admires authoritarians, you know, um, Putin in particular, but not just Putin. He praises Xi, uh, Xi Jinping. He praises Kim, Kim Jong-un. Uh, but the national security establishment that works in this administration is fiercely competing with China, and they realize they need allies. And I'm finding that increasingly they're realizing that democracy matters too. So, you know, I'm a Bush administration veteran, but I think Biden would be much better for our Asia policy and for democracy promotion. But even if Trump wins, I think there's some pockets of support uh, in the U.S. government and definitely on a bipartisan basis in the U.S. Congress. Um, so on the whole, I think we are more likely to support democracy and work with allies on it uh, in the future than we have been over the last three years. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so we don't know who's going to elect it. We have to wait until November 3rd. However, um, even if uh, President Trump is uh, re-elected, Mike is uh, uh, thinking uh, his second administration will look up democracy more seriously, maybe in the context of uh, more keen competition with China. So we'll see. And uh, of course, if uh, uh, Biden is elected, uh, he will be much more committed to democracy promotion than uh, the current President Trump. Uh, okay. Let's uh, invite uh, Druba because Mike has emphasized the democratic cooperation among U.S. Uh, between U.S. and U.S. allies. India does not have an ally, how military ally. However, India is very active in in forming a partnership with uh, like-minded democracies. You already mentioned in the first round of the discussion, but. Uh, can you offer more examples uh, in the second round of discussion, Dhruba? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll make just a few other points which I think are relevant to this discussion. Um, one is that, uh, you know, I think there's a happy medium to be found between uh, EU, you know, on, on the one hand, the European Union, and on the other hand, ASEAN. I mean, if you were to take these two as, as two very different ways of approaching um, of, uh, of approaching questions of uh, democratic unity, uh, the European Union, to the you know, get, to the extent that it was uh, uh, almost a supranational project, um, uh, the, the future may require finding so where where within in that spectrum between the two uh, is a sort of happy medium for, to to establish norms uh, across uh, across governments. A second point related, I mean, I mentioned two aspects of democratic cooperation earlier, which was uh, norm setting and enforcement on the one hand, and I, and I mentioned a few examples of India starting to enter into conversations with Japan, Australia, the United States, Indonesia, and others actually uh, in, in establishing some of those when it comes to uh, things like freedom of navigation, technological standards, uh, supply chain resilience, public health, and so forth. 
Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's a one element of uh, assistance being a, a second element, uh, de democratic assistance, whether it's uh, in the form of economic assistance or technical assistance. But a third, I mean, ultimately, there is a very strong element of um, uh, democratic cooperation uh, through um, th through uh, your self-projection. I mean, soft power, as Joe and I originally meant it. And uh, in that sense, you know, the performance of different democracies is going to matter uh, significantly uh, going forward. And, and I think there are questions about that in, in all of our countries uh, to extend. That being said, uh, you know, I think that it is not necessarily as dire as it's sometimes made out to be. And to give just an example of a recent poll, this was done in 2019 by, by the Pew Research Center. Um, in Japan, and this is after Trump's election, two, years, two, two, two three years into Trump's administration, 68% um, of Japanese still had a positive view of uh, the United States, only 14% had of China. Uh, in South Korea, 77% had a positive view of the U.S., only 34 of China. In the Philippines, 80 to 42. In India, 60 to 23. So the world still looks up to the United States in a manner that, um, you know, for, for, I think for no other reason but because of the values that it embodies. And I think we should keep that in mind uh, going forward. A final point, I think, is, you know, th there are some shared concerns that all countries will have uh, domestically about the future of democracy. I've, I've described it somewhere as the four I's, uh, which are identity, uh, inequality, uh, information, and interference. And in some ways, all, all democracies are contending to different degrees, perhaps, with all of these uh, challenges to the fundamentals of their democracy at home. But that being said, I think that there will be very different responses uh, based on um, the democratic uh, traditions of all of different countries. So. Uh, a U.S. Uh, de style democracy with a very strong sense of individual rights and, and, and states' rights um, it will respond very differently to these challenges from uh, a Japan or a Europe, a European country, which is a sort of nation state, a more homogenous nation state. Uh, and these will respond very differently to an India or Indonesia that, that are, are much more pluralistic and diverse and are, are still in the process of, of state building in some ways. So um, I, I, for this reason, I, I don't think we should sort of look, while we, we will have some shared challenges, we may have to look at slightly different responses to some of these shared challenges. And that would be the, sort of a, a valuable uh, avenue of discussions as we uh, take the, the idea of democratic cooperation, particularly in the developing world, take it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruva. And let's move to Marty. Uh, Marty, we talked a lot about the uh, partnership uh, of democracies within in the Pacific region. However, uh, when we are you know, moving toward the importance of norms, democratic norms, how we protect and how we strengthen, uh, what do you think about the, you know, uh, forging partnership with uh, some European countries? After mm. all, EU has been the strong promoter of uh, democratic norms and human rights. Uh, I've uh, attended many conferences uh, inside Europe. I think that there are a lot of things that Asia and Europe can uh, cooperate for this uh, democratic uh, uh, protection and promotion. So, Marty, it's your turn. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think when we talk of uh, democratic partnership, uh, at the risk of oversimplification, uh, it's useful to distinguish between partnership on democracy and partnership of democracies. Uh, because if we are speaking of partnership of democracies, uh, potentially, potentially, it could be a little bit more uh, exclusive, a little bit more uh, limited in scope, uh, in, in, in its uh, uh, composition. In other words, there is like almost like self-identified uh, determination of who is in and who is out. And of course, it has its benefits because it has it will be a, a, a partnership of like-minded countries with similar visions, similar aspirations, similar concerns and values, and can be unified and in 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 strong unity in in pushing for democratic pr promotion of democratic principles and promotion of protection of uh, democracy uh, elsewhere. But when we speak of uh, uh, partnership on democracy, I think we have to be a little bit more inclusive. 
we have to be a bit more tolerant of diversity of views and and that we we don't have necessarily similar outlook and and let me give you an example on this when we when indonesia began the so-called bali democracy forum that you kindly referred to earlier uh, in the mid 2000s uh, you know we wrestled with this issue are we going to self define and create like a, a fence and, and and determine and who is out and who is in or should we make this a bit more open ended uh, open natured so that we can have a really even sometimes uncomfortable difficult difficult debate between countries of different political persuasions on democracy and I, we thought at the time that perhaps uh, it is best to have a, 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 a process that is more in terms of impact uh, potential to have countries of uh, different nature and different outlook uh, hoping that there will be con a positive contagion impact, positive uh, multiplier impact, and I thought I thought we saw uh, some evidence of that uh, consequence developments on uh, in Myanmar, for instance, the, the the initial progress that has been made in Myanmar, in in some other countries, in Fiji, in the Pacific, for instance. Uh, so there was uh, there is something to be said for a democratic partnership on democracy that is inclusive that tolerates uh, differences in, in, in stages of democracy, so to speak. But partnership of democracies, uh, whether you mentioned European Union uh, specifically, I think is, uh, is something that must be uh, pursued. And in Indonesia's case, we definitely, in the early stages of our democratic reform, really look to Europe, really look to our like my, um, other democracies in helping us strengthen our democratic institutions, uh, uh, capacities. Some of the most um, outside the box, some of the most exciting institutional capacities created in Indonesia post-1998 uh, came early on in our democratic uh, reform process. Uh, the, constitu the constitutional court, the uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, body, the uh, human rights uh, body. But then a lot of these uh, institutions' capacities can become can become dormant, can become uh, can lose steam uh, in the absence of uh, concern nurturing and and concern uh, uh, investment of efforts. But I'd like to turn, especially if I may, uh, to the po some of the points that uh, Bu Teresita uh, mentioned earlier. I mean, I'm uh, like others, very much uh, you know would like to echo the points that she had said. And you know the, the current democratic architecture, democratic uh, dynamic in our region is not is not uh, the most uh, conducive. Uh, and and it's, I can be, I can say I'm quite despondent to be honest to see where we are now in our region, uh, the incapability of leaders to speak up uh, and and uh, you know on on situations that is clearly uh, uh, against. The many principles that collectively countries in ASEAN, for instance, have subscribed formally and officially, and yet uh, there is often deafening silence in the face of all these situations. And uh, my thought at the moment, as as you had just now suggested, in terms of concrete response, you know, I thought in the absence of uh, leadership at the formal state-to-state -state level then it is critically important for the civil society to develop a, a partnership and especially to develop democratic response to some of the uh, concrete issues that we are facing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on the environment, on the pandemic, on economic stimulus, on counter-terrorism, for instance. We must provide an alternative script that these day-to-day -day real problems can find solution through democratic response rather than authoritarian response. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. I think you brought the important point uh, about this democratic uh, partnership only between among democracies or uh, democratic talks, more inclusive one uh, on democracy. I think that these issues usually pops in in every forum when we address uh, democracy. Uh, in that point, I wonder, uh, Takasu, uh, Ambassador Takasu, uh, Japan um, is trying to, to 
include, um, for example, China to the broader talks, talking about the good governance and, 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 and democracy and perhaps human rights? And what do you think about this point? Right. Uh, I'm very happy to do that. But just before the, the perhaps much more bit general picture, uh, before talking, focusing on China, how to do China, that's a very important course. First of all, a Sunnyland process with Sunnyland principle is a very important initiative, and we're very pleased to be associated with this. And our team in Japan uh, will continue to push forward the Sunnyland process and promoting the implementation of uh, principles. And as a follow up uh, next month or early November, we're trying to organize a similar webinar like this uh, to target Japanese decision makers. Uh, that's very, very important. So I hope we'll be able to discuss specific action plan, particularly by Japan then, and I hope some of you are kind enough to join such event. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the, you know, the what is the basic uh, approach or importance that we should bear in mind pursuing a partnership on democratic governance in this region. Uh, first, I think it's important that it should not be led by the United States. It's not the U.S. Uh, how to call it, effort to create a group of uh, countries against China, for instance. Put it very bluntly. It should be, I think, Asian-led effort. And you have heard already uh, some of the comment. And ob obviously, I know uh, American colleague called democratic unity, and some of you you also using. But I'm really reluctant to this. Because unity gives this impression, just like Marty mentioned about the so-called uh, group of democracy, exclusive to. So I'm using, uh, the, we are using, I think, a democratic partnership, but my own democracy. I think this is very important, I think, to be around. The next one is uh, democracy promotion. It's normal in American English, of course. But here again, I think we should be very careful. It should not be misunderstood that we're working together to promote one type of democracy, based U.S. democracy or some government. I think uh, uh, every country has to have, have the choice, right to choose their political system, so long as uh, they are responding to the popular, popular will. So not one type of uh, government system. So we're using the so-called support of democratic governance. I think this is a very important, I think, definition. So what is the universal values to be pursued? What do you mean by democracy or democratic governance? I think it's important, as I say, every country has the right to choose their particular political system. But in this typical political system that I choose, there is a common feature. That is a common thing we are talking about. In other words, any authority in power, any system, has to pursue good governance, accountability and transparency, quality, equality of everybody under law, rule of law, and the independent judiciary and freedom of expression. And, of course, avoiding corruption, so and so. This is what democratic governance, I would say. Bali Declaration of Good Governance and also World Bank has governance indicators. We have a common uh, internationally accepted uh, yardstick that we can, you know, check the progress on this one. In other words, it's a fair, inclusive society. It's a goal 16 of SDGs. So SDG 16, the inclusive society, become very important as ever because of COVID-19 attacks uh, vulnerable people most and exacerbate inequality. So we need more argue, I mean, you know, forcefully argue. Nobody is uh, perfect. Nobody is uh, omnipotent. So freedom of expression and good governance are absolutely essential to correct any error because everybody can, can make error. So what, how to do this? I think uh, we have been talked about this, but I think uh, there could be a layer of uh, partnership. In other words, there is a core group who have a real shared universal value. I think, uh, you see, so that I think, but it's um, natural or unrealistic to expect that there are so many countries in this group. But as again, it should be inclusive. So therefore, there's the second layer, which is much broader. And uh, Germany and others are, you know, getting new interest in democracy in, in Asia Pacific, I think. There is, I think, uh, of course, uh, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, India, uh, Australia, uh, you know, that is very, very clear, group. But we have had difficulties facing uh, civil society in Philippines, Indonesia also. The, the momentum is a little bit away from others. So I think uh, we can talk about several layers of this, but also level of partnership. We cannot talk about only government. 
as Marty mentioned, I said, it's a little bit difficult now to talk about this. Of course, we have to do this. And parliamentarians, as well. In civil society, I think it's uh, very much, I think, broader we can talk about on the think tank and academics. So a few additional specific points. Uh, what the uh, JCIA study group is doing to raise support, political support to this. And we organized the diet round table and uh, many other things. And uh, I think uh, important to policy in, promote policy dialogue and networking uh, with uh, civil society organizations in the Pacific area. And I can report you uh, because, well, not because perhaps our effort, but anyway, there is a strong interest in a political circle in Japan and the media about this issue. And for instance, uh, there is a new parliamentary group of LDP on international rulemaking strategy. This year it started. And uh, they work uh, against weakening of democratic principle and the erosion of rule based international order. It's, in, it's very, very influ influential. Uh, and also, uh, Japanese uh, researchers are encouraged now to join the research program. Probably, uh, Professor, your group, I think, uh, is very, very important framework for that. And also, we are encouraging Japanese CS, uh, civil society organizations to be more active in Asian network. And uh, so we are exploring, forming a network of CSO in Japan. Uh, some additional thought about uh, China. Well, before that, what we are trying to do is to raise the priority of Japan in democratization support in the national security strategy and official development cooperation charter. And they try to be more forthcoming to the support to the civil society organizations. But the one word about China, uh, how to manage relation with China is a major challenge. And Japan, I think, uh, realize it has a very important role to play. And uh, Japan should promote candid dialogue with China on this issue without compromising universal value, but seek common ground on good governance and multilateralism and rule-based international order. You know that China is very active yeah, externally in the bilateral effort or across the multilateral initiative, I would call it, like BRI or AIB, it's across the multilateral, or mask diplomacy where China virtually alone possess decision-making power or governing influence. But in other multilateral forum, China acts passively as a member of developing countries that accorded, as you know, favorable treatment to undeveloped countries. It's a very comfortable position of China, of course, but no longer tenable because power is accompanied with responsibility and reciprocity. So I think the approach to China, our approach to China would be to encourage. Now they have achieved great power status with strong economy and advanced technology. They should be more actively engaged with real multilateralism, not quasi multilateralism. Means genuine multilateral framework cooperation where no country, even great power, cannot determine, dominate. They have to coordinate, they have to cooperate, and they have to share the responsibility with an equal footing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Yukio Takasu. I think you have a very valid point that the, all this uh, uh, democratic partnership in the Indo-Pacific region must be Asia, Asia lead. Uh, so namely, not the United States uh, led uh, partnership. And at the same time, our cooperation should not be uh, used or, or played as uh, any uh, containment uh, efforts against China. I think uh, those points, I, I'm sure many Asian uh, people will, uh, will support that argument. But at the same time, it's not easy um, uh, to uh, fight against any uh, dilution or any distortion uh, of uh, democratic norms that has already established in um, the global governance, for example, in U U United Nations Human Rights Council, if uh, any effort uh, from China to weaken established norms, we have to work with the West. Uh, Asian countries have to work with the West, European countries, and, and the United States to stop that kind of movement. So uh, I think uh, there is a conceptually is we have to distinguish but at the same time, as a strategy or practice, we have to uh, work uh, the 
the, the countries in the region have to work with the, the Western democracies. Okay, um, we have um, many good uh, questions from audience, but we have only um, 15 minutes left. So I will just uh, choose four questions, but uh, it can be very serious. Number one, and one of the audience has asked, there is a battle of narratives between democratic uh, system and authoritarian system. And, and I guess the, uh, he, uh, he or she is thinking about um, the, the attractiveness of democracy has been uh, weakened because of uh, the performance issues, because democracy is not bringing economic growth, economic development, and democracy maybe is not effective in controlling uh, COVID-19. All this uh, functional performance-wise, uh, many people the, uh, have emphasized that, uh, this uh, one because that has been um, uh, kind of uh, a dick Consolidating uh, the the attractiveness and even soft power of democracy, so how we can win the battles of narratives or discourse vis-a-vis uh, -vis the authoritarianism? This is important question. So who wants to address this question? Mike, okay, you raised your hand. Mike and Teresa. So. Oh, um the best way to win the narratives uh, or this narrative battle, and there is a narrative battle, uh, Beijing is clearly engaging in a, a information warfare, uh, attacking democracy in a way that Hu Jintao's China or Jiang Zemin's China wouldn't have done, but that's Xi Jinping's China. The best way to counter it is to do exactly what Ambassador Takasu and Marty Navagawa said, don't have the U.S. lead the counterattack. Um, have the broadest, most important agenda-setting forums for democracy be led by other countries in Asia that have successfully defeated COVID, or at least curbed it, like Korea, like Taiwan, and, and, and certainly relative to the U.S. and Europe, like Japan. Um, so that's the way you do it. I just want to say, though, there is a very important role for the United States still. Um, within or perhaps behind that broad, inclusive effort, there still needs, in my view, to be a caucus, a quiet grouping that compares best practices. And, you know, Takasu-san said Japan's considering direct funding of civil society. That would be terrific. That's what the U.S. does. And I, I think those are the kind of best practices we need to coordinate among a, a smaller group um, behind the scenes, if you will, on how to be most effective. And the U.S. is going to have a critical role in that because we have the largest budget um, you know, for democracy promotion and a lot of successes and failures. The other thing the U.S. will do, um, without doubt, is call out human rights abuses. There would be no President Kim Dae-jung, there would have been no President Korea Aquino if the United States hadn't pushed hard against authoritarian leaders. So that's still going to be critical. But in terms of advancing capacity building, democratic norm building, I think uh, Marty and Yukio have it exactly right. Thank you. And Teresa, uh, before you answer the first question, there is a second question uh, in a, uh, designated to you, and that's the question of uh, uh, Bangsamoro. I think in Bangsamoro there must be some <coughs> violence. So uh, he, the audience is asking how the Philippines should fight against violent extremism. Um, uh, so maybe you can just uh, combine your answer with uh, another answer to the second question. Teresa, go ahead. Yes. Um, you know, first on the question of um, of the narrative, I, I think in a way the democratic crisis now is really a wake up call for the democratic forces that we have not that um, the issue of inequality really needs much more attention. That uh, this is the the grievance of those left behind has been the one that has been tapped by the non-democratic forces to uh, turn the world around and to say that uh, past democratic leaders don't care, they just leave you. And that's the narrative uh, that they are going to be able to solve it. Of course, inequality is not going to be solved um, overnight. Uh, that takes processes and it takes democratic processes. But in a way, I guess what happened was we lost 
we lost the conversation. We 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 stopped engaging people as to how these longer structural problems are really going to be need to be addressed by everyone, and that is part of what we need to do to recapture the narrative. And obviously, it's not just going to become. It cannot be left on the technical level. It cannot be left on the concept to a level and that is why I had mentioned earlier the importance of tapping into the cultural narratives uh, into the language uh, because in a way that is something that they have done they have they have captured that they have become the common well our uh, president has been like the common person that uh, the man in the street uh, but actually offers no solutions but apparently he has captured the language so that's important uh, to do and as, uh, as I said again, also earlier, the savvy use of social media and information technology because while we were doing our work, while we were doing our work, they work social media, they work the information technology and we need to learn to be smarter and shrewder about that as well. So the content, the how to, how to, um, how to express it in the language that really speaks to people and the use of the media to bring that out. Uh, but on the question of the of the Bang, Bang Samoro and, and the threats of um, violent extremism, um, in the, indeed we push the we push the uh, Bang Samoro peace process. We push the Bang Samoro autonomous government uh, to provide a buffer against this. And that's the main challenge now is to prove that this can work. To prove that enhanced autonomy is really inclusive it, it's, and it's competent, uh, because otherwise um, that hope that in fact the problem of exclusion, the uh, what has been long uh, complained about as as not really being included in 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 the, in the Philippine uh, nation, uh, has got to be disproven, and that was the idea, that was the vision. The politics and the governance and the Bang Samoro has to be a joint project of everyone to make sure that it works. And uh, just as a last point there, the continuing neglect of the Philippine government of what happened in Marawi is certainly making us again so vulnerable to many, especially the young people, to say, we, don't, we give up on this, you really don't care. We need for the entire Philippine nation to say again, yes, we care, and we are going to invest in making sure that that inclusion translates in a real improvement of lives of people. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, now, maybe I'd like to invite Druba and Mike to answer this question. That is, that China's foreign minister recently commented that Russia, Mongolia, and others in the region must work together to counter emerging regional threats. And they are very much concerned about U.S.-led multilateral security bloc in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and so they are intervening, I mean, China is uh, intervening in Mongolia and Nepal to uh, prevent them to sway into the U.S. and India side. And to this move, how India and USA should respond. That was the question. So, Druba, you want to comment on this? Uh, sure. Uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't quite characterize that as exactly what is happening. Uh, I mean, uh, both Mongolia and Nepal uh, are, are countries that are, are quite autonomous and have their own relationships. I mean, ne Nepal has an open border with India. There are seven regiments of the, in the Indian army that are staffed by Nepali citizens. Um, so I, I think it's, it, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it in those terms. Mongolia, of course, has been a partner of many countries, including the US and co multilateral coalitions uh, quite recently. Um, but I mean, obviously, there, it, it feeds into this idea that there are competing narratives and we're perhaps entering a world where the, 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 fra the um, the, the fractures are more stark today um, between India and China, between Europe and Russia, between, you know. Uh, um, uh, so uh, I think that it actually does feed into this issue of competing narratives because, uh, and, and, and there isn't a sort of easy answer to it. But one point I would make 
is that um, I, I do think we are entering into a world where, where a little bit more reciprocity might be warranted, which is in democratic societies, you know, India, where I'm from, or the U.S., the press regularly criticizes the government and points out all its flaws. And that's the, that's the job of the press. That's the job of a free and open press. Um, what we are seeing is uh, authority, the, the, the press often with ties to the state of authority, authoritarian governments uh, uh, using their, their media, their state-sponsored media, to also make attacks against other governments and, and distribute it uh, quite widely abroad without allowing reciprocal access for distribution of uh, free foreign press uh, to those countries. Um, and I, that in some ways contributes significantly to uh, sort of the narrative distortions that we are seeing in, in many places. So whether it's on social media and Twitter is now identifying state-backed entities on Twitter, including state-backed media, uh, arguably a long overdue step uh, but the fact is, you know, we, we still get uh, China daily inserts in, in publications in other countries. Um, we get, uh, you know, uh, RT shows up in hotel rooms in Europe. Um, and, uh, and without, again, the, res the reciprocal access that these countries get. So I think that that needs, is, is one of those things, I mean, in my personal view, that, we need, that needs to be examined a bit more carefully and something that democracy should be cooperating on uh, a little bit more. Uh, to uh, redress some of uh, the, the narrative imbalances, if you will. Thank you, Ruba. Mike, do you want to add something? You know, the Chinese interference in Mongolia and Nepal, uh, uh, perhaps? You want to, Mike? Uh, yeah, I, I, spent, um, I spent last summer in Mongolia. And um, uh, in my first uh, few days there, uh, we drove out to the steppe from Ulaanbaatar. And if you've been to Mongolia, you know that once you leave Ulaanbaatar, the, the road system is very bad, very bad. And so I asked my driver, why don't you take funding from China for Belt and Road Initiative? He was very quiet for a moment. And then he said, in Mongolia, we would rather have books than bridges, hmm. um, which was a pretty powerful statement. And uh, I enjoyed the rest of the bumpy ride much more. Um, Mongolians call the United States and Japan and Europe their third neighbors. Um, if they were, a, they must be terrified right now because of what is happening in Inner Mongolia and in China, uh, where um, people are being forced uh, to, to, to learn Han Chinese and not learn, to learn Mandarin to not study Mongolian. This is not the main purpose of our discussion today, and it's not the responsibility of most of the countries represented on our panel. But I'll tell you another reason that democracy matters. And I agree with Marty very much that it should be partnership for democracy. But one reason democratic unity matters is if, if countries like China or Russia think the United States or major U.S. allies, Japan, Britain, Germany, Canada, Australia, if they think that we don't care about democracy, they're going to be much less deterred to interfere in Mongolia, to interfere in Poland, in Eastern Europe, eventually Nepal, so that's not the purpose of this panel. I think everyone here is interested in improving people's lives and, and, and justice and progress. But from a national security standpoint, caring about democracy sends a very strong signal to countries that are thinking about uh, or wondering about the consequences of um, interfering with or in, in possibly the case of a Nepal or a Mongolia, you know, subverting uh, the independence of countries that are democracies. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I will ask uh, Marty and uh, uh, Yukio to answer these questions. Uh, that's about the marginalization of the people. Um, not only in this pandemic, I'm sure in climate change crisis and many uh, financial crises, whatever, usually marginalized people like uh, women, children, immigrants, and poor people will be hit hard, right? So how in this kind of emergencies, uh, the people, uh, uh, the countries like uh, the, your countries of a panelist, how, what should be done uh, in order not to leave these people, these vulnerable people behind the emergencies? Uh, Marty, do you wanna say something? Well, Thank you very much uh, uh, for that question. If I may turn to the first question first, if, if you don't mind, because it has some resonance as well to, to what I, I wish to say. 
uh, in terms of uh, democratic versus authoritarian system. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I am familiar with this notion of uh, peace dividend, uh, peace dividend in the sense that our region, uh, however defined Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific, uh, in a way you can say we have been beneficiaries of decades of peace uh, in the traditional sense that have enabled uh, countries of the region to pursue uh, economic development and prosperity. Uh, but I think we are at a, at a stage, at a juncture, where uh, beyond uh, absence of war, in terms of peace defined as being absence of war, we are also seeking a democratic dividend. Uh, you know, we, we are convinced and we are of the view that ultimately democratic response to some, some of the main problems that we face uh, are the most uh, uh, sustained, the most uh, an approach that enable a sense of common ownership, a sense of common partnership, uh, and we all of us then become vested in the efforts. And and I think it is incumbent uh, for all of us who are uh, who are of the view that uh, democracy matters to actually. Uh, uh, provide counter narrative that ultim ultimately uh, democratic response uh, uh, do, are the one that are likely to be sustained, the one that is to be effective, and the one that is more equitable uh, as a result as well. This relates to the actual specific question that you ask on the marginalization of people. Uh, you are quite right, uh, the, the, the person who had asked this question. Uh, if we are not careful, uh, well-intentioned efforts, whatever domain it may be, it may be counter-pandemic, it may be a stimulus package to deal with the economic downturn as a result of the pandemic, it may be to do with uh, an, env an environment, efforts to develop uh, food security, for instance. These well-meaning efforts uh, without the requisite democratic outlook risk marginalizing and leaving behind the vulnerable and those people who need most uh, protection, uh, the voiceless, so to speak. Because we have seen too many efforts in this part of the world, well intentioned, uh, no doubt, that in its process uh, have left many uh, disadvantage and, and, and suffer as a result. And whether it be on the pandemic that we are now, I mean, how on the pandemic, for instance, on the, on the um, very stimulus package, economic stimulus package that's being talked of and being implemented nowadays in many government by many governments. How can we ensure that the stimulus package uh, are directed and received by those who are in most need, the most vulnerable? Uh, do we have the, the requisite data uh, management, data information? That, that is uh, uh, something that is still uh, out there as as uh, as a question. I think whether in the end, whether we are really going to build back better, build back in a more equitable way, or we are simply going to reinforce uh, current uh, uh, inclinations and current uh, inequities as well. But it, since I have uh, the, 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 the mic, so to speak, just very quickly, uh, uh, I would like to just sum up in, from my perspective, there are a number, two or three key nexus that we must find some kind of a solution on. Uh, the first one is, I already mentioned, how can we make the case that democratic response is the most effective response to various challenges that we face nowadays, to mainstream democratic response uh, so it becomes the most natural and the most uh, uh, at the forefront of all our efforts. So I think that task remains uh, before us. The second one is how can we uh, dismiss uh, or uh, manage this notion as if democratic partnership and non-interference is an either-or, is, is, is a conflicting uh, uh, goal. Uh, we have to have a counter-narrative that actually a democratic partnership and non-interference can go hand in hand. Uh, uh, non-interference should not be used as a shield uh, for undemocratic uh, practices. And I think we need to find a narrative for that, uh, a, a response to that. And finally, uh, democracy and geopolitics. Uh, and, and, and this is where I think we have to be smarter 
uh, we have to ensure that there is no weaponization of, of uh, democracy. democracy. Uh, I know that is certainly not the intention of uh, partners and friends like the United States and, and others. I know that they are well calibrated in their approach. They wish to create a sense of ownership, sense of partnership in the region, and they know that sometimes less can be more. And, and, and here I think uh, uh, we need to be smarter and calibrated in our approach. So those are the three nexuses that I think we need to be thinking through on. And of course, uh, amidst all those, the role of uh, civil society must be a running team as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. Let me invite Ambassador Takasu uh, to answer how we can protect the most vulnerable during the emergency time. Just a couple of sentences because of time. First, I, I would say that uh, before COVID, I think uh, this issue of uh, inequality and also marginalization has uh, been in existence. That is uh, one of the contributing factors of backsliding of democracy. And the COVID-19 has uh, accelerated this process and revealed everybody's eyes very clear who suffers most marginalized people, elderly and uh, you know, uh, children and others. So I would say that it, I mentioned about SDG's goal, objective, is no one left behind. This is exactly the concept, to leave no one left behind. SDG 16 is targeted most vulnerable people, most marginalized people focused on and the marginalized country. And you, obviously, we need solidarity, and COVID-19 has raised solidarity, but not, not, unfortunately not global level yet. I'm advising a different capacity secretary general on this issue, and the UN has launched so-called UN Solidarity Fund, Recovery Fund, and response is reasonable, not so bad. And as mentioned, genuine multilateral cooperation is uh, that everybody's playing a part of this, for instance. And I really like country like China, every country will be part of that. Of course, in bilateral, every country is focusing on vulnerable people, Japan is too, and many other countries. And also, you know, the basic income co concept and other things are raising grounds. And I think uh, we have uh, been, I think, you know, the prioritizing this area very much, bilateral and globally. Thank you very much. I guess we had a great discussion. Uh, of course, I cannot wrap up all this great uh, d uh, discussion. But however, my take is that everybody uh, agreed Asia countries in the Indo-Pacific region should play more role in defending and promoting democracy. And especially, we need to provide more innovative ideas and also resources into uh, more concrete programs. And here, uh, in the, I, my take is that in we, when we are forming narratives, there are norm narratives. When we develop norms, uh, we have to say that democracy can do better and actually is doing better in many areas, protecting vulnerable people and also sustainable uh, growth, whatever, vis-a-vis -vis authoritarianism. Uh, that's important. And also there is a strategy narrative. And Marty has mentioned a very excellent point that uh, democratic partnership is not conflict with the uh, non-intervention principle of uh, ASEAN or other Asian countries that tend to prescribe, subscribe. So therefore, we need to uh, develop this uh, strategy narrative. And then we need to develop more concrete program with the small D programs, with the, all the concrete niches, we can do better, okay? So that's great conversations. And then I'd like to thank you five excellent thought leaders to share their ideas and their visions. And in order to continue this wonderful webinar uh, with the similar topics, I'd like to ask audience to fill up the satisfaction survey questions to improve the quality of a conversation next time. Thank you so much and, and good morning still and, and good night in this week. And thank you for the audience. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. you.